organizations. They came last night and competed um, in individual rooms in front of different sets of judges, and those judges uh, put their ranks together and said, these are the students we think that should go to the finals round. So let's begin by just giving the students a round of applause. Please. So um, I want to begin after, after that with introducing each of our judges, the, the table in the back, and we, we, I don't know which one is going to be the mean judge and which one's the nice judge and which one's the funny judge or anything like that. But funny. <laughs> funny. There you go. Any claims funny. Um, we have uh, the judges volunteer to be here too. And so they're giving of their time just like you're giving of your time. And so I want to do a quick introduction of each of our judges. I'm going to try to get this correct. So here on the end in the blue is Catherine Scully. Catherine is the Assistant Director of Academic Services at Front Range. Would you please give her a thank you? Um, skip the chair with the green balloon. The next, the next judge is Amy Mann. Amy Mann drove all the way from the Boulder County campus at 5 o'clock to help judge tonight. And so when we clap for her in a second, give her an extra of love, okay. of love please. Um, Amy is the outgoing chair of the Arts and Letters Department up there at Boulder County, and she's going to begin her job as the director of the Academic Success Center. Amy teaches communication and teaches public speaking, so she really knows what's going on back here. And um, she, is, uh, she is the Boulder County Campus Master Teacher last year, okay? So please give Amy a round of applause. We have Dr. Uli Putri. Dr. Uli Putri teaches public speaking here on our campus. She's a fantastic teacher. I myself have been in her class observing her class. We actually had to lose Uli for a couple of years, but now you're back and we're really excited and thank you so much for judging tonight. Would you please give Uli a round of applause? On the end here, we have Mike Koss. Mike is an instructional dean at Red Rocks Community College. Uh, but that's not really where his roots are at. His roots are here at Front Range. Mike was a professor in pretty much everything um, here at Front Range <laughs> before that. Um, and uh, he is also a former master teacher for our campus, and I think he said it was in 2011. Mike has been judging this finals round for us. Is this your third or fourth or fifth year? Six, seven. They all bleed together. Yeah, they all bleed together. Uh, Mike, Mike is fantastic. Have a conversation, please, with Mike, um, and thank him for coming all the way down from Red Rocks. Thank you. Mike. So tonight, our speakers—we um, have five, and that is all. Our speakers tonight are competing for scholarship money and visa check cards. Their no, gifts. No, no, no. Just scholarships. Oh, oh, just scholarships tonight. <laughs> okay, I was all wrong with that. Just scholarships tonight. So. We want to thank, yeah, we want to thank the office of the vice president. Kathy Pellish um, okayed and gave these scholarships for these students. And Kathy's not here right now. Sometimes she is. We want to say thank you. We also want to acknowledge when people who have way too much to do make a point to show up tonight. Um, our Dean of Wednesdays is here. Would you please give her a round of applause? I don't know. Mike and April noticed, like, the life of a dean means you're scheduled for five meetings at all, all at the same time, mm -hmm. and, and here you are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you have to duck out early, that's cool. We know. <laughs> all right. So, everybody, big deep breath. This is for our first speaker. The speaker order is determined randomly, um, except for the one student who's in class till 640. They get to go last. Okay, um, our first speaker tonight is Ailish McDonald, and Ailish is going to be speaking on equal opportunity for education. Please give Ailish a big hand.
how the brain functions and processes information. It's crucial for students with learning disabilities to have access to the general classroom. Unfortunately, in our current education climate, the norm is for students to be separated into special education classrooms and not included with their peers. This is even after the National Council on Disabilities reported in 2018 that the best learning outcomes were a direct result of inclusive classrooms. There, furthermore, they stated that there was no research supporting the usefulness of segregation in classrooms. The segregation causes a lack of self-confidence and disinterest in school for students with learning disabilities. These same students reported how paraprofessionals in special education classes were often condescending, furthering their lack of self-assurance. This led to a disinterest in their learning and stopped them from improving their work. In segregated classrooms, there may be a short-term benefit of higher standardized test scores, but it stunts the student's overall knowledge, self-assurance, and ability to grow. According to Mimi Korkaran, the president and CEO of the National Center for Learning Disabilities, children with learning disabilities with learning and attention issues are as smart as their peers, and with the right support, they can achieve at high levels. But a lack of early or effective interventions leads too many kids to a diamond wood spiral. What she's saying here is students with learning disabilities have, if given the chance, can be just as good in school as their peers. We need to create an environment that builds self-confidence and self-determination in students with learning disabilities both of which are noticeably lacking recently. We need to have teachers who nurture a student's voice, their soundness in their process, thought process, and their reasoning. We need to allow, a, create an environment where students are able to give answers that can have a more developed thought process <coughs> and receive both positive and negative feedback versus a you're right or you're wrong. By doing this, we allow students with learning disabilities to lean into their strengths rather than feel limited by what they can only show on standardized tests. Michael Weyheimer, a distinguished professor for special education and the chairperson to the Department of Special Education at the University of Kansas, notes how teachers often focus, often don't focus on teaching a student with learning disabilities to be active and intentional in their own learning even though self-determination promotes progression in education. We need to find a way to teach students to learn to problem solve by following steps and strategies at a pace and in a way that works with their disability. Wayheimer also saw that, also says that self-determination is an essential outcome for a well-rounded education because it is the foundation for many other skills that a successful student needs. Critical thinking is the self-determined process of purposeful reasoning and problem solving to examine an issue or an idea. Through collaboration, debate, and discussion of different viewpoints, students are able to see and encourage out-of-the-box ideas, as well as many different perspectives on a topic. If students with learning disabilities were able to be in their general classroom more often, they would provide a great insight and a very different perspective that not all students get to see. This thought process and this way of teaching not only improves the overall cognitive process for students with learning disabilities, but for all students in the classroom. If we can develop this way of thinking in a student, they are able to utilize, they're, they're able to utilize self-awareness and reflection skills. This leads them to be self-aware and active in their own learning process. Weyheimer saw that students with disabilities who are, part of, who are part of finding their own accommodations for learning were far more likely to succeed. They were able to become a self-advocate for what they needed to be able to do best in school. To add on to that, Michael Cavan, the head of Iowa's Department of Education, stressed the importance of having accommodations for students with learning disabilities and how every learning disability is different and therefore every accommodation would have to be different as well. So through this process, a student is better able, able to better understand how they learn best and take on their learning themselves. If they know what accommodations will work,
they'll have an even greater chance to succeed not only in school but subsequently in the workforce later on. The solution to such a complex cognitive landscape requires an equally complex idea, or at least the acknowledgement of its complexity. By incorporating critical thinking into mainstream practices, we can create an educational environment where students identify with their disability instead of where students identify with their ability instead of their disability, leading to more success in school and beyond. Students with learning disabilities suffer from the stigma of not being smart because they're not always successful in traditional settings. The teaching status quo has failed to create a learning environment where students with learning disabilities can understand their strengths. Schools need to teach in a way that shows students how smart they are and how smart they can be. We need to increase the self-confidence in these students and therefore increase their desire to be a part of their learning process. Now I want you to think about someone you know who has a learning disability, whether it's your students, your kids, family, friends. Would you want their teachers to think that you or that someone you care about is being lazy simply because their brain works differently? I want us all, I urge you all to become aware of how you're being taught in classes and get to know how your school chooses to teach students with learning disabilities. This way, we can strive to creating an environment where everyone has an equal opportunity to education. Thank you. Sarah Peterson. And this speech will be on the Charlie and Brayden Act. Give Sarah a hand. Desiree News quoted their grandfather, who said, 
Both boys that morning had indicated that they did not want to go see their father, and that Brayden was afraid of his father. Little did Chuck know this would be his last memory with his grandchildren. Despite Charlie and Brayden's fear and Josh's impending arrest for possible murder, the boys were required by law to attend their visitation session that day. When they arrived at Josh's home with the social worker, Josh pulled the boys inside, pushing the social worker out of the home and locking the door. Charlie and Brayden died in 2015, 2012, excuse me, at the ages of five and seven. They were killed due to multiple hack wounds to their head and neck from a hatchet, followed by an arson house fire, which killed both the boys and Josh. Because of Josh, Charlie and Brayden are now gone. At the beginning of my speech, I asked you to imagine what it would be like to lose a child that's close to you because of something that could have been avoided. What happened to Charlie and Brayden could have been avoided if the proper laws had been put in place. Nothing can bring Charlie and Brayden back, but there are things that can be done so that other children aren't placed in similar dangerous situations. The Charlie and Brayden Act was first introduced in Washington courts on February 1st, 2013. According to the Washington State Legislature, the primary purpose of the act is to prohibit granting custody to a suspect in an active murder investigation. Chuck, quoted by Fox 13 News, said, if this law had been enforced, it may have very well prevented the death of Charlie and Brayden. So why was Josh, the prime suspect in his wife's disappearance, allowed to see his kids? The answer is simple. There was no law in Washington preventing people in Josh's situation from seeing their kids, so Charlie and Brayden were put in harm's way. As sad as Charlie and Brayden's death was, it helped the state to see the need for a law protecting other kids from similar situations. On May 13th of 2013, the Charlie and Brayden Act was instituted in Washington. Not only to protect kids in similar situations, but as a way to remember Charlie and Brayden. This act has changed Washington State for the better, helping keep more children safe, and it can do the same for other states as well. This law could have a positive impact on Colorado. Our kids cannot control the world around them, and they cannot protect themselves, but we can and should be protecting them. If a similar law was instituted in Colorado, we could protect more of the innocent and unprotected children in our state. Washington State Senator Roach, quoted by the Susan Cox Powell Foundation, said, To me, this really seems like common sense. If the police suspect that you killed someone, you should not be granted custody. This statement is applicable for putting a similar law in place in Colorado as well. Putting children's safety first must be the top priority. It simply isn't worth the risk of leaving them in a possibly dangerous situation. In conclusion, Charlie and Brayden's touching story helped the Washington State Legislature acknowledge the need for a law to protect children. This law should also be instituted in Colorado to help protect more kids who cannot protect themselves. Charlie and Brayden will always be remembered and loved, not only by those who knew them, but by those who have been protected because they could not be, by those who are kept out of dangerous situations because of the law they put in action. Kids just like your nephew, child, niece, sibling, or cousin, who deserve to be happy and safe. You could be a part of this change for our state. You could help protect these kids. So don't be afraid to let your voice be heard. Email your senator. Call your local state representative. We can keep a tragedy like this from happening in Colorado.
for the night is Max Wakefield, and Max's speech is called Mind Your Business. Give Max a round of applause. Imagine yourself at work, your boss is breathing down your neck, asking about efficiency, when the reports are going to be done. All these are different subjects of your job. The best reply that comes to my mind is a quote from a renowned author, William Burroughs, in his 2015 book called Naked for Lunch. It reads, there's nothing more productive than minding your own business. While my personal experience overseas through the military and working on many uh, personal security details got me interested in this subject. And over the past few weeks, I've done some research on the pros and cons of minding your own business. And I've determined you should mind your own. <laughs> <laughs> I've discovered four main reasons that people don't or don't feel the need to mind their own business. Some just believe they know better. Others are disconnected or unhappy in their own lives. Others find your life more interesting. And lastly, many people feel that they're saving you. After I've described each of these reasons, I, I believe people butt in, I'll explain to you when it is appropriate to be involved. I hope at the end of the speech, you will understand the importance of minding your own business. I would like to begin with one of the more simplistic reasons that people cannot stay out of your business. Some people just feel they know better. Just think about work, those over or under you, your students, your family. Doesn't it seem that they're always kind of giving advice on subjects that they don't know too much about? Well, there's a reason for this. According to a 2017 article by Todd Nordstrom, the head author of Incorporated.com, he wrote an article called Employees Think Too, and 79% of employees quit not because of the job, but because of a boss micromanaging. Now, that's a big number. Micromanaging, by definition, is control every part, no matter what size, enterprise, or activity, which I think we can all agree is coming from someone thinking they know more than the person doing the work. Now, there's a fine line between a good boss and a micromanaging one. You don't have to leave your employee to the wolves to keep them at the company. Same thing with the students or your family. The solution is simple. One must ask or offer. This gives someone the freedom to make their own mistakes, to find their own strengths. But it's not always easy. We want to help other people. We want to give them ideas, make things go faster or smoother. But this is a perfect opportunity to offer some guidance. If they deny it, maybe they have a better idea. And if not, it's been proven that trial and error has been the best teacher. Not all our bosses, parents, or teachers feel they know better. Some are just simply unhappy with their lives. Many people feel a certain disconnect from themselves, which can make them unhappy, leading them to butt into our business. Jessica Charlotte, an English literature and language professor, wrote an article in 2017 Harvard Business Review titled 10 Things Unhappy People Should Stop Doing, in which she argues that unhappy people need to feel that they're in control. They want to ensure they know every detail to enable them to have full control. If this is a possibility that it's you or someone you may know, a fix isn't hard to come by. I personally like to make lists, so a list of deadlines, um, X, Y, and Z needs to be done, main, main points, big things that matter. I can make a list of this, and for those who I oversee, I can, instead of asking them question and question, I can ask a certain set. And if this is being done, that shows that productivity is also being accomplished. Same thing for when my boss asks me questions. I can say my deadline will be met, met and X, Y, and Z are happening. It also helps when issues arise. If something happens, I know that X and Y happened, my issues with Z, and that's a perfect time to offer guidance. 
Let's assume that not everyone is unhappy with their lives. Perhaps they're just bored, for my third reason. I believe that when people become bored, they find your life more interesting, and it's natural for them to want to insert themselves into whatever you're doing. A 2018 article posted in the Dallas Morning Newspaper, 10 Reasons to Mind Your Own Business, by Lomita Civic, who is the founder and blogger-in-chief of PurposeFairy.com. She states that people actually enjoy other people's business. Furthermore, the access to today's social media has made butting in and putting in your two cents that much easier. Robert E. Wilson, a, a social scientist at Washington University, stated last year over 800 million comments were made a day in which people give advice to people they don't know. Now, I think we can agree that's a lot of advice from strangers. <laughs> I myself notice this a lot with family. I feel like there's always that aunt or uncle that asks a little too many questions and kind of gets in there when they don't, no one really wants it. I find it funny that everyone kind of knows how annoying that is except for them. <laughs> now, if you're listening to the speech, and this could be you, maybe you should just piggyback off a conversation already happening for a little bit. It might help out. And do your best to leave out sex, religion, and politics. And remember, they're not you. Don't expect them. Moving on, let's deduct our previous three reasons and assume that this new nosy person doesn't feel they know more than you. They're not unhappy with their lives, and they're not just sitting on Facebook bored out of their minds all day. What else could they possibly be butting in so much? Of course, this person needs to quote unquote save you from yourself, or in some cases, your generation. I see this happen a lot between the older and newer generation. Jason Pfeiffer, who's the CEO of Webman Network, wrote an article titled, um, Why We Continue to Trash Our Young for the Medium Culture Magazine in 2018. He utilizes early texts from 600 BC showing that parents still complain about their kids, you know, and today it still happens. I believe that this is a lot about fear. From generation to generation, no matter what year, we have historically always wanted to save our young. We, we always wanted something, we want them to do something that we know, that we have done before and we can know the answers. But times are changing continuously, and because of that, it scares us. Maybe we don't know the answers, and they do, and that's a scary thing. Many of those who do this don't mean any harm. They really don't. All they want to do is save you from whatever they think you need saving from. But as Buddha said it, no one saves us but ourselves. No one can and no one may. We ourselves must walk that path. So let them walk it. If you're close to them, help them when mistakes happen. Offer your help. You don't have to force it. So what does this all mean? It's been proven in multiple aspects of life that people don't react kindly to those who stick their noses in others' business. Whether it be at work with someone breathing down your neck, whether it be on social media, or just an aunt asking too many questions. It's important to remember that not all these reasons are intentional. That specific someone in your life may just need a quick reminder. Hopefully the speech shines some light on the subject, and consequences can be noted and more attention can be focused on the jobs that need to be done in our own business. And as Betty White said, I don't know how people can be so anti-something. Mind your business, take care of your affairs, and don't worry about it so much. I don't know how to start without unminding my own business. I really want to take your advice, and I don't also don't want to interrupt you. I kind of have to, so would you give Max another hand? <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is Laura Cardonia. Laura's speech is called Why You Should Be Grateful and How You Can Implement It. Please give Laura an applause. For this. Thank you. 
you all for being here tonight. In our society, we are told that we should express gratitude. We have a holiday, Thanksgiving, and we're supposed to express what we're thankful for that day. But how can you achieve the goal of gratitude? It is pretty vague. I want us all to take a moment and right now pause and count our blessings. Count what we're thankful for. This can be your family, your friends, but I want us all to just take a few seconds and just think about what we're thankful for in life. Whether you are thankful for family, friends, opportunities that come your way. For me, I'm thankful to be here tonight giving my speech. Or you could be thankful for something more simple, like getting through the coffee shop line quickly this morning. That's something I would be thankful for. But at the end of the day, why does this matter? Well, counting your blessings is actually one of the most important things that you can do. Today, I am going to tell you why you should be grateful and how you can implement this into your life. First, I'll cover the research behind this. And then, I'll talk about all the strategies you can use so that you can easily implement this into your life. First, I'll talk about the research behind why you should count your blessings. In preparation for this, I read multiple research studies. The research is dense, but tonight I will break it down for you. The research for gratitude stems primarily from observational studies. In most of these studies, participants are asked to fill out a gratitude survey. In this survey, it is anonymous and they are asked to tell the truth about how many things they are thankful for and how they express it. One such study comes from Robert A. Emmons of the University of California, Davis, and Michael E. McCullough from the University of Miami. In their research, they found that a grateful response to life circumstances may be an adaptive psychological strategy and is an important process by which people positively in interpret everyday experiences. The ability to notice, appreciate, and savor the moments in your life has been viewed as a crucial determinant of well-being. Now, what does this mean for all of us? Counting your blessings is a way to notice and appreciate the positive elements of your life. And if you are able to do this consistently, you will develop a habit to continue to do this every day of your life. Another study comes from Philip Watkins, who had a similar observational study to Emmons and McCullough. In his study, he found that one component of gratitude appears to be the ability to recall more positive <coughs> relative to negative events of one's past. Their next major finding was that the memories of grateful individuals had more positive emotional impact than did the recollections of their less grateful counterparts. Again, what does this mean for us? Clearly, gratitude is good, but what does it actually mean for a normal everyday person, someone who is not in a research study? Well, it means that a grateful attitude can help when we are recalling a memory. So the next time you recall a memory, whether it is good or bad, if you have a grateful attitude, your emotional response to this memory will be much more positive. Another study, getting a more international perspective on the aspect of gratitude, comes from Fritz Strack from the University of Mannheim in Germany, and Norbert Schwartz and Elizabeth Schneidinger from the University of Heidelberg, which is also in Germany. Their findings show that the present research demonstrates that reminiscing about both positive and negative experiences can influence a person's sense of happiness. The present results also show that the nature of this influence does not just depend on the quality of the events, but also when the events occur and the attitude with which they are thought about. What does this mean for us? It means that how you think about events will likely influence your overall sense of happiness. This has found that events, good or bad, can have a more positive effect if you have a grateful attitude. At this moment, I want us all to take a look at a situation and see how positive, grateful thinking can actually help us with dealing with the situation. Right now, it is the end of the semester. It is a very stressful time for students and for professors as well. So at this time, we are approaching finals week. I, myself as a student, am getting a little bit stressed about finals as they are approaching, as I'm sure many of my fellow students are. Let's assume that there is a student taking a biology class. And in this biology class, they have a very difficult final. And the teacher has been telling them, this is the hardest final I've ever assigned. And let's assume that sadly, the worst case scenario happens. And the student does very poorly on the final exam. Now, of course, the student is not going to be grateful that they did poorly on an exam. That would not be a reasonable response. 
But when the student is recalling this memory in the future, say at the beginning of the next semester when they're signing up to retake their biology class, they can have a grateful attitude and say that they learned from the experience. They saw, I don't need to worry so much about unit one. Maybe I should focus more on the units in the middle. Maybe I should have studied more. Maybe I should have paid more attention in class. All of these different lessons that they learned from a, ne a negative experience will have a much more positive impact on their emotional response if they think about the event with gratitude. Now, we've seen that gratitude is proven through scientific research to have a positive impact on people's lives. But now, I want to talk about how we can actually implement it into our everyday lives. The studies demonstrate that being grateful has so many benefits, but these strategies are backed by research as well, and they will help, help improve your overall sense of happiness. One of the strategies comes from Bruce Campbell, who created the ME and Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Fibromyalgia Self-Help Program. He recovered from this disease and created the self-help program to help other individuals suffering from this illness. He claims that gratitude is a choice that we can make, and it can help improve your outlook on life and, to an extent, improve your health. According to Bruce Campbell, one of the best ways to increase your gratitude is by keeping a daily gratitude journal. So, you can do this by having a journal that you keep by your bed or on the kitchen counter, wherever it may be, and take a few minutes every day, or you could even take less. You could take 30 seconds and write down three to five things that you are grateful for. And with practice, this will actually become a habit, and you will find yourself noticing everything that you're grateful for in your everyday life. It is important to set aside a time so it becomes a schedule, and with practice, you will become more grateful and happier in your life. This technique has helped people who suffer from chronic illnesses, and if given a chance, it could help you with your own life circumstances. Another strategy comes from Janet Miller, who is writing in Forbes magazine. She says that you should appreciate everything and avoid being picky. Being grateful does not just mean appreciating the big events in our life. It means appreciating the little things. At the beginning of the speech, I mentioned that I would be thankful for getting through the coffee shop line quickly. We can be thankful it is spring. We can be thankful that the weather is nice. We can be thankful that the flowers are blooming. There are so many little things that we can be thankful for if we just take the time to notice them. If we can apply this by appreciating even the small things in life, we will have a much better positive outlook on our life and feel happier. Another strategy comes from Robert Evans, whose research I pre previously talked about in his speech. In his essay, adapted from his book, Gratitude Works, he states that no one feels grateful that he or she has lost a job or a home. Or in my example, no one feels grateful for doing poorly on a test. But there is a difference between feeling grateful and being grateful. You cannot force a feeling. You cannot force yourself to feel grateful for a negative experience in the moment. You cannot force yourself to stop being sad. But what you can do is have a grateful attitude. It's a prevailing attitude that will endure, and it is immune to the gains and losses that flow in and out of our everyday lives. It is when you're faced with a difficult circumstance that gratitude can help by providing a different perspective. It's important to look at the bigger picture and not to be overwhelmed by temporary circumstances. These are only three techniques that you can use to be more grateful and appreciate life's moments. Once you master these techniques, counting your blessings will become second nature. In conclusion, today I talked to you about why you should be grateful and how you can implement this into your life. First, I deconstructed the research behind it. I looked at complex research studies and I found how we can use their findings and make it more applicable to our everyday lives. Then, I talked about how we can incorporate gratefulness into our lives. I provided three simple techniques that anyone can learn to apply. We can learn to keep a gratitude journal. This doesn't even have to be a journal. You could have a sticky note that you write things that you're thankful for. This can be anything. It could even be on your phone, on an app. There are so many ways that you can implement this strategy. The next strategy is to be grateful for everything, even the small things in life. And the last strategy is to find a way to have a grateful attitude, even in life's most difficult circumstances. Now, at the beginning, we all counted our blessings. 
If you can list at least one thing that you are thankful for that is scientifically proven to increase your happiness and overall well-being. At the end of the day, the evidence demonstrates that being grateful and counting your blessings provides so many benefits to your life. There is no reason not to choose the path that leads to the most personal happiness and satisfaction for you. It is easy and simple, and in my opinion, there is simply no excuse. Thank you. So continuing with the theme of, of following what the speakers say, thank you all for being here tonight. We give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're here for extra credit, give yourself a round of applause. And then let's give Laura one more round of applause. Our final speaker of the night, and I feel like I should point out, uh, got out of class 20 minutes ago, and here you are. Thank you so much, okay? Um, our next speaker is Lindsey Brand, and she will be speaking on the importance of preschool. Please give her a round of applause. The goal of education is not to increase the amount of knowledge, but to create the possibility for a child to invent and discover. To create men who are capable of doing new things. Jean Piaget, 1971. In a survey I conducted at Front Range Community College on April 2nd, 2019, I found that 65% of students believe that preschool is important. And in the 14 years that I was a preschool teacher, I have come to really believe strongly in the importance of preschool. Here's one example why. I had a child who was starting his first year of preschool. He was starting kindergarten the next year. Couldn't write his name, didn't know any letters of the alphabet, couldn't count. By the time he finished, six months later, he could write his name, knew most of the letters of the alphabet, and could count to 10. <clears throat> in this speech, I will cover the importance of preschool, of early childhood education, why so many children do not attend early childhood education programs, the impact of not attending an ECE program, and why preschool teachers are not just babysitters. <clears throat> From the outside, it looks like preschool teachers are doing no teaching at all. They're just playing. But study after study has shown the importance of a quality preschool education. They have found that it can help counteract difficulties that a child has later on down in their schooling. <clears throat> in a New York Times Magazine article from January 9, 2018, by Jenna Interland, she states that preschool can help close the gap between lower income Hispanic and black students and higher income white children. So much so that by the time they start kindergarten, the language gap and numeracy gap have effectively closed. <clears throat> There are many reasons why children do not attend preschool. One reason for this is that preschool is expensive. An article in Baby Center states that the average cost of preschool is between $372 and $1,100 a month. Wow. In an article in Fatherly by Dave Baldwin from October 12th of 2018, he states that an, um, another reason for the cost of preschool is the cost of actually running the preschool. He states that it can cost around $400,000 a year to operate a preschool. Now this was a fictional preschool, but it does give us an idea of operating costs. Another reason that children do not attend preschool is because parents and caregivers do not have the same access to funding for preschool that they do for college, like grants and loans. They also don't have the same amount of time to prepare for preschool, unlike for college. This is from an article from, 2000, or from 2019, March 9th, from The Conversation. As a result of the high cost of preschool, I do feel that it is understandable that parents and caregivers do not enroll their child or children in preschool. Consequently, this means that many children are socially 
and academically unprepared for school when they start. The National Education Association article from April 5, 2019 states that children who attend preschool are less likely to repeat grades, they're less likely to need special education, and they're less likely to get in trouble with the law later in their lives. Now there are other possibilities as to why children don't attend preschool. One possible, another possibility for this is that parents and caregivers see teachers as babysitters or caregivers. Why is this? One reason is that the age of children in preschool is very young, typically between two and a half to five or six years old. So the thought process often goes, if, you can't, if a child's not ready for K through 12 schooling, what are you teaching them? So therefore, it can't be teaching. I conducted another survey at Front Range Community College on April 2nd of 2019, and I found that 35% of students believe that preschool is just play. Now, when I was starting college, and people would ask me, what are you studying? And I answered, early childhood education. I'm going to be a preschool teacher. Oh, so you're just going to be a babysitter? This response told me that many people do not think that preschool is, any important, is important at all. Now, in an article by Their World, it states that roughly 80% of brain growth, brain development and growth, happens in the first three years, and 90% by age five. This means that most brain development happens within the first five years of life. Now, in preschool, children learn many things. They learn how to get along with others, empathy, cooperation, and to regulate their emotions. In other words, social skills. They learn cause and effect through block play. And when they play with water, they learn that water is fluid, not solid. Preschool teachers help children learn these all-important life skills. Now with this information in mind, I would like to look at some solutions to the above stated problems. One solution for the high cost of preschool is for the government to actually take a look at their budget and to look at money and figure out ways to make preschool more affordable and to pay preschool teachers just a little bit better. Another way to help counteract this is for teachers and parents to band together and lobby the government to make preschool more affordable. <clears throat> now, the fact that many people say preschool is just play, a way to counteract this is for preschool teachers to come together and create ways that are exciting and new for parents and caregivers to understand what their child is learning in preschool and why it's so important. Now today I've looked at the importance of preschool, why so many children do not attend preschools, why teachers are not just babysitters. I would like to thank you for your time this evening, and I hope that I helped you understand just a little bit as to the importance of preschool and why children should attend. I would like to leave you with one final thought. Play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious learning, but for children, Play is serious learning. Play is really the work of childhood. Fred Rogers, 1979. Thank you.